This well, conference will now be recorded. Welcome to session seven. I don't know why I have session seven, but it is session seven, which covers chapter seven of more than a carpenter, chapter 11 of more than a carpenter, uh, which is entitled, Will the Real Messiah Please Stand Up? Uh, this is uh, kind of a good culmination of where we've been, obviously, as we wrap up this. Uh, it's one more area for us to increase our confidence on what we believe and why we believe it and have a, a sound basis for our beliefs. So, uh, and there's a little bit of math involved in this lesson, so that, that helps me out. So I like to work with uh, some numbers. So we'll play some numbers games later on. So, All right. Uh, <laughs> so you might want to have your calculator out just in case. So I open this one by talking a little bit about uh, identification security or or identification verification of either one of you had your uh, your ID stolen yes well, yes Kathy yes um, just yeah more credit card fraud than anything yeah just like on a gas pump or something yeah 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 I've had that uh, as well but it is one of those things that's uh in our day and time, I guess uh, it's not that uncommon, and but it sure makes you nervous when it is so easy for it to happen. And then, oh my. fortunately, I've been, in, when it's happened to me, my credit card company is calling me almost before I'm pulling out of the gas station to let me know. Wow. Yeah. So they it's really are good. <laughs> surprising how good they are on that end. So, uh, but they also call me if, back when I used to travel and they'd say, uh, Mr. Kurtz, have you, did you have dinner in this city and then you rented a car in this other state and then you had dinner somewhere else the next <laughs> night? I'm like, yes, I did, sorry, <laughs> just making sure. I'm like, yeah, that's all me. Uh, so when, when those things come up, what do you feel is your most secure personal identification? You know, like if so like if the number. bank calls wants to verify that it's you, if you're working with your bank or something, or you need something to verify that it's really you, what do you what's the go to? What do you think is most secure in your identification? I'd say your social security number. Yeah, most people want to say social security number. You know, the social security number is um, let's see how many digits. It's nine digits. Right, it's a three. Yeah. A two, oh, yeah, nine. Four. 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 So it's nine digits, mm -hmm. and each one of those digits could potentially be 10 numbers, you know, zero to nine. Mm -hmm. And so, so 10 possibilities times 10 times you, you take 10 times itself nine times, or 10th mm -hmm. to the ninth power, and that's how many variable combinations you could have. So I mean, 10 to the ninth power is a pretty big number. It's 100 billion. Um, so there haven't been 100 billion US citizens. So I read somewhere in the process looking it up that they, they don't think they'll have to repeat social security numbers until sometime after 2030. And who knows if social security will still be around. Uh, so that's, I guess, good news. But they don't use every number. Nobody has the, the yeah. combination of nine zeros okay never been issued they don't start any numbers begin with six 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 um so there are some numbers they don't use so not every combination <laughs> is available but so that's what makes it feel secure is the fact that it's it has to be it's a very specific number right when you get to nine digits and then you know your typical credit card a typical credit card how many numbers are on a typical credit card 12 or 16 16 so so because it has 16 digits that's more that's more numbers than a social security number so you would think that would be a more secure number obviously the magnetic readers is what makes that less secure but so the, it's that type of uh, the more numbers that are involved in pinning a person down, theory is that that's more secure, right? Mm -hmm. um, so 
in this study, we've looked at multiple ways in which to validate that Jesus is Lord. Um, and, you know, wouldn't it have been simpler if instead of a whole bunch of prophecies, God could have just said, you'll know the Messiah because his identification number will be 231-50-4397. That would have been simple, right? If we knew his social security number, then it would have been obvious. Well, that's kind of facetious. But anyway, the purpose of this lesson is to look at it that way, to see what did God provide as a way of securely identifying who Christ was. And we'll look at the Old Testament prophecies and show that those are a way to validate who Jesus claimed to be. So we will move on. So in uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, and uh, uh, if you have your Bible, that might be handy because we're going to get to some scripture. I'm not going to read them all, but um, since they're just couple of us here, I guess we'll need to be quick on our fingers, but I'll read Galatians 4.4, 4, <clears throat> where it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So what does it mean when the fullness of time had come. When his, when Christ, um, or Jesus's time for his birth and everything yes. to come be born, right. that was the fullness of time? Right, fullness of time, it was, and I think, we're, so what we'll look at is it's also part of the fullness of time so that all these prophecies could all be checked off. And there's a bunch, as we're going to see. So, and part of it was having to be there, for instance, when the temple was still standing. Mm -hmm. um, in the course of history, that's not a huge amount of time. It was something less than 500 years, most likely. Uh, that it was standing, and so that that narrows it down. You think of, you know, even you think about um, the missionary journeys of, of Paul and stuff, and there had to have been some type of communication system, travel system. So anyway, a lot of things had to be in place in general, but specifically fulfillment of prophecy also had to be there. Um, so First Peter. And I'll try to get to this one too. First Peter one is a is a passage that's kind of interesting. It's one that, despite being in a familiar New Testament book of First Peter, it's not a verse that um, all that familiar with. And this is what it says: Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of grace that would come to you? searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffrage of christ and the glories that would follow to them it was revealed that not to them themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Anyway, like I said, familiar first Peter, but not that familiar with that verse. But, you know, what did the prophets search and inquire carefully about? I think when the Messiah was supposed to come. Right, right. And how they would know. And so they, they poured, it basically says that they were kind of pouring over existing scripture and they were also careful with what they themselves would prophesy concerning now sometimes um you know they probably didn't even know what they were writing down because it was so far ahead um that you know it's just like us if you were to prophesy of some event that's going to take place 500 years from now would you say and it all began because so and so sent a text message 
you know, probably not. I don't I don't know that text messaging is going to be around <laughs> 500 years from now, but you know, it, it seems real cutting edge to us, but 500 years from now that would be like what? Um and so <laughs> you have to think that they had to be the messages that they picked up about prophecies may have not made any sense to them um, or it was just bits and pieces but it is interesting to see how it says that they were really careful with what they prophesied about uh, the Messiah and so how good a job prophesying did they do could they have done something a little bit better in your opinion well the spirit was what was giving them the words to say so right. i don't think it could have been right so if you're going to trust that we got everything we needed mm -hmm. it, it may not have included identification number it's true um, but they but didn't have security numbers yeah it's it's interesting <laughs> to know that in revelation you know the prophecy of the antichrist there are numbers involved which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting but again prophesying thousands of years ahead of time that something like an identification number may be a critical component you just never know so uh, so we're going to look at uh, some of these uh, prophecies as we go through and if the prophets themselves searched and inquired carefully then it's appropriate for us and others to do likewise you know as you know if somebody wants to find out just like josh mcdowell started this whole process that he himself to check it out, dig into the data, basically, to see is Jesus this fulfilled Messiah? You know, it's available and somebody can research and look into it and reach their conclusions similar to he did or, um, you know, some of the others who've gone that route. So, here's, so we're gonna get into these prophecies. We're not gonna get into all 60 messianic prophecies. <laughs> and 270 ramifications but that's what they say the total is um, so i have a i have a john macarthur study bible that i use and in the back i looked up uh prophecies of the messiah and i got pretty excited because i started counting through them and i came up to 60 something i think i came up to 65 and then i realized that for each one of those in a lot of cases there's more than one reference so these are just 65 different things so i think my list probably includes some of both the prophecies and the ramifications um, what's the but, difference? but go ahead what's the difference well i think it's just how you list them i'm not sure okay. between a messianic prophecy and a ramification i think the prophecy itself is specific to the individual the ramification is and so then uh, it will usher in, you know, the Gentiles will be saved. And anyway, some of the things that happen as a result okay. or that, uh, you know, different nations would come together and worship the same uh, God. Anyway, some of those things, most likely, uh, you know, one redeemer rule over the world. Those are all ramifications. Those weren't things fulfilled while Jesus was here, but it is part of what jesus ushered in i guess okay. that was probably the distinction that i would say i didn't get a real good definition of that but that's a good question that's my best answer okay <laughs> it makes sense yeah mm -hmm. so we're going to start looking at some of these prophecies and just think of it as this humongous funnel in the timeline of history of all humanity that has existed on earth from the inception of time how do we get down to this one individual? And one of the early verses is Genesis 3.15. And this is in Genesis where after the fall and God's talking to Adam and Eve, and he says to Eve that there's gonna be enmity between the serpent and her, but at some point in the future, uh, she will crush his head. Uh, the seed of a woman will crush that the serpent will bruise his heel but this seed of the woman will crush his head and that's seen as a messianic prophecy uh you know whether or not everybody saw that when 
you know, I guess in the first century, I'm not sure. But as we look back on it, when we think seed of a woman, that's, I guess, in our modern times, that's not that dramatic to us. But, you know, in the Bible, genealogies, you're not going to find seed of women. You're going to find predominantly everybody there is the seed of some male, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that statement itself, right in chapter three of Genesis, does narrow it down. Uh, if you were looking for somebody who would be, um, I guess, who would you could point to and say, yes, that's a seed of a woman, not a man. Uh, so anyway, it, it's almost almost like saying virgin birth, but not quite. Um, so anyway, that, that's pretty interesting. So that's one right out of the gate there in Genesis. And you can follow these through, you know, that he prophesied the lineage through Abraham. So we go from Adam and Eve, we're passing through, um, uh, you know, you, the lineage goes to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, and Jacob having 12 sons. And it doesn't fall to Jacob's oldest son. It falls to his third oldest son, Judah. Uh, the tribe of Judah is where it would originate. And then we say a rod from Jesse and a branch from David. Okay, so these taken right through uh, the timeline of the Israel nation, that's narrowing it down, right? It's uh, mm -hmm. excluding other tribes. It's excluding other people. So that itself narrows it down. It doesn't do a great deal because... Uh, but if you think about the the people who lived during that time, that certainly would have been clear to them that any Messiah uh, would have to come from that lineage, right? Right. So we'll keep trying to narrow it down. Um, and <coughs> so there is a, what I'm going to go into now, there is a, a gentleman, um, uh, <coughs> his name right now shoot i had his name on sunday now it slipped my mind and uh he wrote a book uh entitled science speaks and in that book uh, he, t he talks about that if eight prophecies were fulfilled and he talks about the probability of that happen uh let me see over there there it is. Uh, Science Speaks by Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner is the author of this book, Science Speaks, and he that was written around late 50s, 60s, and so that was someone similar. You know, this book more than a carpenter written in the 70s, so they're closer to contemporaries. But he, what Peter Stoner did was he took eight specific messianic prophecies, and he went to a group of graduate statistician students, you know, people majoring in statistics and presented these ideas to him and said, what's your best guess of the probabilities of that one thing? And mm -hmm. so he starts with Micah 5.2, uh, which says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, okay? And so he tried to see what is the probability of someone being born in Bethlehem. Well, at the time in at the time when he was doing that work, let's say late 50s, and they added up the number of people who had been born on earth, how many of them were born in Bethlehem versus other parts, and this was the number they came out. 1 in 280,000 is what they came up with as their probability. Now today, you know, decades later it would be even more than that right um, because i'm sure the world population is growing much faster than the number of people being proportionally than the number of people being born in bethlehem um, still people born in bethlehem but just proportionally <laughs> there's a whole lot more people being born elsewhere right um, yeah. but so one in 288 80, 000, so a pretty big number so let's so that's prophecy number one. Second one. Um, 
if somebody wants to turn to Malachi, I'm going to have a few in Malachi. And if somebody could turn to uh, Zechariah, that's the other chapter that I've got several. So uh, if I've somebody. Got Malachi. Okay, okay, why don't you take Malachi and Donna, if you could take Zechariah and just kind of go to chapter 11 ish or something like that in Zechariah. And let's see what Malachi 3 1 says. Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Okay, so so this Messiah, born in Bethlehem, one of the attributes of this important person was that they would have a forerunner ahead of them. Now, maybe if you're a big deal in history, having somebody going ahead of you is not all that unusual. They they estimated for that specific thing, they thought that would be about one in a thousand. Okay, all right. So now you got one in a thousand uh, that there would be a forerunner. So next, Zechariah nine nine. Okay. Not exactly where I had you turn, but close. Okay. Rejoice greatly, people of Jerusalem. Shout for joy, people of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you. He does what is right and he saves. He is gentle and riding on a donkey, and on, on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey. Okay. So yeah, we this ver we hear that verse at Palm Sunday. We hear that as that that's a prophecy that this important messiah person would enter jerusalem riding on a donkey now it doesn't say the last week of their life riding on a donkey it just says we'll enter jerusalem on a donkey um so they didn't put the probabilities that too high um i guess there's a lot of people riding donkeys into jerusalem i haven't been so i wouldn't know but um one in a hundred not a big number but i guess if you're going to be in that part of the country there are donkeys wouldn't be you wouldn't have to go too much out of your way to at some point in your lifetime hop on one and ride into town i guess that's why it's one in a hundred so now let's look at the the next one back to zachariah i'll just have uh, donna be our zachariah script okay. reader and this is zachariah 13 verse 6. okay but someone will ask what are the deep cuts on your body? And each will answer, I was hurt at my friend's house. Okay, so this is basically pointing to <laughs> the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend, okay? Someone close to them. Um, they, for that prophecy, estimated one in a thousand. One more, Zechariah eleven twelve. Okay. Then I said, if you want to pay me, pay me. If not, then don't. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. Okay. So this is speaking again about the betrayal and that there would be 30 pieces of silver involved, uh, which is a very specific number uh, to throw out, you know, hundreds of years ahead of time. So they put put that at one in 10,000. So much bigger, prob you know, much smaller probability. So it's very more rare that that would be part of it. Now, the next part gets even more so, Zechariah 11, 13. The Lord said to me, throw the money to the potter. That is how little they thought I was worth. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and they threw them to the potter in the temple of the Lord. Okay. So that the fact that the silver was also not only received, but cast into the temple. So that's specific because like I said, the temple was only around a certain period of time that people had the money that that's where they took it and threw it. Probability on that one in 100,000. So again, that's, that's getting very specific. So those are six prophecies. I thought there was one more back. Oh, this one. Uh, I think this is the one that says, uh, 
Well, I, I, I'll get that one. I've got that one. 57. I thought there was more in Malachi. Sorry about that, Kathy. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> fine for me, not fine for Donna. <laughs> <laughs> he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. So this one has to do with the fact that the Messiah when oppressed and afflicted would not try to defend himself and i guess this was also seen as pretty rare that that would happen when crimes charges of crimes are brought up but would not open his mouth uh would not try to defend himself one in ten thousand on that one and then we go to uh the last number eight and this is out of uh, psalms 22 uh, in Psalms 22, verse 16, it says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count on my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, there's a lot more than just hands and feet pierced in there. The fact that it says they divide his garments, and how do they divide them? by casting lots. I mean, that's two specific things there, but mm -hmm. just this hands and feet are pierced. They put it one in 10,000. Now, the other interesting thing is, uh, so that prophecy in Psalms was written, it's believed was written about 1000 BC. And wow. the, uh, was it 1,000 or 800? Anyway, I think it's 800. No, it was 800. 1,000 BC, and and the uh, the Romans didn't start using crucifixion as a form of capital punishment until like 200 BC. Hmm. And so there's 800 years between that being written and crucifixion being a thing. Wow. Um, so that's the type of thing where we said earlier that some to prophesy hundreds of years in advance you have to be talking about things that you don't even know what it even means hands and feet pierced for us that means crucifixion but there's no way that uh the writer of this if it's david that the writer of this psalm there's no way he would have known that crucifixion would have been a thing you know a uh, thousand years later uh no way of knowing but hands and feet pierced. Um, you know, that whole Psalms 22 is full of prophecies about how the Messiah would suffer. And if you recall, when Jesus is on the cross and nearing death, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalms 22, verse 1. And a lot of the things that I've studied on that, when Jesus uttered those words on the cross yes you could say he felt forsaken by god but he could have also been telling anybody within earshot hey go read psalm 22 i'll give you the first verse you read the rest of it and you'll see everything that was going on at that moment in time um, because it's it's just full of prophecies that were filled by his suffering on the cross so all right, so when you deal with probabilities, so we've got eight of them sitting before us. Um, when you deal with probabilities all trying to be on one person, you have to multiply that potential. And so one, the way to do this is if you look at this, and I'll start at the bottom, that's 10 to the fourth, next one up, 10 to the fourth, next one up, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the third, 10 to the two, 10 to the third, Okay, so then we come to born in Bethlehem 1 and 280,000. He rounded down to 1 in 100,000, so that would be another 10 to the 5th, or yeah, 10 to the 5th there. No, 10 to the 6th there. So um, so you multi so each one of those, 10 to the 4th, 6th, 5th, 4th, you add those exponents together is would be our math lesson of the day when you're when you're multiplying you add the exponent and you come up with 10 to the 15th 
or I'm sorry, 10 to the 17th. So down here in the lower left. So what Peter Stoner came up with of those eight prophecies, the chances of that happening is one in 10 to the 17th. And you see all those zeros spread out. That's the probability of those eight things being fulfilled in one person. Now, we go back to our, well, there's 60 messianic prophecies and 270 ramifications. Somebody's attempted to calculate that one, and the chances of that all being fulfilled, not 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 157th. Hmm. Okay. That's a big, big number. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you start counting this, I mean, that's millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, and beyond. The easiest way to say that number is it's a hundred million billions. Hmm. Wow. If you had a hundred million billions. So no, so I tried to think, okay, how can you visualize a hundred million billions? So if you took one cubic foot, one cube, a, a cube that's one foot on each side and filled it with sand, that cubic foot might have a billion grains of sand in it. You'd need a hundred million of those <laughs> and count those particles and then know which one it is. Or as the example he gave in the book, let's say, Let's say you had a hundred million billion silver dollars and you decided to spread those out across the state of Texas, it would bury Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. And then if you took one of those silver dollars and you put a big X on it, and then you blindfolded somebody and you turned them loose in a some type of vehicle and they could travel all across texas anywhere they wanted for as long as they wanted but at some point they could stop reach down and grab one silver dollar the chances of them reaching out that one time and grabbing the silver dollar with the x on it one in a hundred million billion And that's the probability of fulfilling eight prophecies, not 60 and 270 ramifications. Yeah. So it just is mind boggling when you start thinking of these prophecies that have been put together. And so going back to kind of where we started of how good were the prophets in giving us identification, a secure identification number of who the Messiah would be. Now, how else can you explain it other than it points to one person? Well, there's those who would suggest that the prophecies were stuck into uh, the Bible, even the Old Testament, they would say, after Jesus' life, uh, which has been proven to be false because they found you know, Dead Sea Scrolls, which were predate Christ and contains these same prophecies. So that did not happen. They weren't added in to the Bible after to make it look good. Could Jesus have deliberately tried to fulfill them? Now, let's not just say Jesus, but how about Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and the disciples? Could they have been in collusion together to try to carry these out? And the answer is, yeah, I guess you could say some of them. I mean, being born in Bethlehem, if Mary and Joseph decided, hey, there's this scripture in Malachi, we better hop on a donkey and head to Bethlehem. Yeah. Um, maybe, again, is it possible? I guess. But how about when Jesus dies that he's pierced in the side? Who had control over that? you know, or, you know, doesn't have control over being born of a virgin. Uh, I don't think even Mary had control over that. So there's pieces of this that you can say that they could deliberately manipulate, but there's 
plenty of pieces that there's no way could be deliberate fulfillment. So if not for those, then the other answer is that God supplied the prophecies and he fulfilled those prophecies in one person. One in 10 to the 157th people probability. Why did God go to all that trouble? Because they weren't handing out social security numbers. <laughs> and that's much more secure. Ten to I mean, just think we we're talking about social security numbers as being 10 to the ninth, and our credit cards as being 10 to the 16th. Okay. We're talking eight prophecies, 10 to the 17th, and having more than that going 10 to the 157th. That's more reliable than even our best security identification system. So what does uh, John 14, 6 says? That's where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if this person, who is the one in 100 million billion or more, verified identification to belong to the prophecies that God supplied, that God fulfilled, why do people still want to believe there's other ways to a relationship with God other than through Jesus Christ? I think people just don't like to be told what, what to do. <laughs> Nobody likes to be told what to do. They want to do it their way. That's right. Yeah. Because if if Jesus is this one in a hundred million billion, then maybe he's everything that he said he was and that God uh -huh. says he is, which means that he's Lord and has the authority to say what I should do and not myself and that's what people don't want to get to is to get to that point where they have to acknowledge that he's the only one who could fulfill the hundred million billion potential and that if he is then he has the right to be lord and to for me has the right to tell me how i should live and what i should and should not do so Anyway, I, I think that's pretty interesting. I mean, we've looked um, over the last, through these sessions, you know, we've looked at all these different ways where through this study of different ways to enhance or validate what you believe and to add certainty to it and confidence to it. And, you know, whether it's, you know, the claims that Jesus made of himself or the fact that there's just not that many options of who you say Jesus is or the reliability of the Bible or the changed lives that took place afterwards uh, or the, the resurrection really happened or this probability that Jesus, you know, that all each one of those itself is pretty good. You put them all together and it's a pretty rock solid system to have confidence in what we believe so is there any just in wrapping up is there anything that stood out to you in this that has given you more confidence assurance certainty validation of what you believe than another area I think that just how they described that that being an address that everybody had an address and it was right went down to every and you know it just you know gave more confirmation and like okay yeah yeah it's right. definitely you know it's like there's just you know even to hold that argument with or even to, to try and defend it to someone else and it's like right. these are the facts you know, right. you know there's no sense in you arguing with me you're gonna have to argue with god because you know no, there's no way that this could happen any other, you know, you can't rec recreate this. Right. Right. So, you know, it's, and I, I think some of it is people just, we get, 
I mean, we throw out millions, billions, and unfortunately in our, our national spending, we're now throwing out trillions. These are big, big numbers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes a lot to get there. Um, I was even, even after, after class on Sunday, uh, Richard came up and he was telling me how many tens of thousands of cubic feet of water pass through the Bagnell Dam when the gates are fully open. And mm -hmm. I think it was like 50,000, which that's a big number, 50,000 gallons a second passing through the gates. And so I went back and I played the numbers and to get to these kind of figures that we're talking about, 10 to the 17th, that water would be have to pour in out of that for like 10,000 years. Whoa. You know, it just, that's per second. Anyway, we just, when you start throwing those, that many zeros, it takes a lot to get to the next zero. Mm -hmm. And we just, I think, uh, from a probability standpoint, it's one thing to say one in a hundred thousand, and maybe you could say, "Hey, that's that's not that special." I bet there's been. No, you're probably right. I mean, in the billions of people that have been born, one in a hundred thousand, you've got, you may have a couple thousand. You know, cool. You know, but you get to the ten to the seventeenth on that number. <laughs> it's just. How else can you explain it? Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I hope that uh, there's found value in this. You know, at the very beginning, we said, you know, hit, the whole point of this is to get to the point of having confidence that my faith is important, but it's not. Yes, there. sometimes there's blind faith in how we have to approach day-to-day -day stuff. But in our faith that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, there is a reasonable, logical, intellectual basis for that. And we shouldn't feel like we have to hide from it or feel like we're not science-based or logic-based or intellectually based, right? We have plenty right. on our side. And so that's why you know, I said I, I think this is a good the book. I hope you've uh, got something out of it and I think it provides a great resource to keep on your shelf because there might come a day and you might want to explain how putting uh, silver dollars across the state of Texas helps you explain why mm -hmm. Jesus has to be Lord so yeah. anyway uh, <laughs> thanks for participating I'm going yeah, I to... enjoyed it yes me too